if you look at the way that the women's reproductive system is organized, it's, I think, one of the single best pieces of evidence against God. <laughs> it's just terribly, <laughs> terribly put together. Hello, dear casuals. This is Emmanuel Tolstoyevsky, and our guest today is Dr. Diana Fleischmann, an American evolutionary psychologist at the University of Portsmouth. We talked about all kinds of fun stuff, such as jealousy, murder, porn, racism, monogamy, disgust, and also a bit about humor and effective altruism. Hope you enjoy it. And also a special thanks to Switch and Board, who organized this interview. So I, I've been interested in evolutionary psychology for quite some time, but I have no idea how how you actually do it, how you people do what you do. Us people. <laughs> uh, yeah, so evolutionary psychology, we would say that it's actually not a theory so much as it is a, a lens, you know, a way of looking at the human mind. So it's a way of considering how psychology, aspects of psychology uh, could be useful. Mm-hmm. And just to kind of basics, there's two main ways that evolutionary psychologists often come up with hypotheses to test. There's many others, but two of the ones that you can think of would be a way of looking at something that you see ubiquitous in human psychology, let's say something like jealousy. And then you think about what kinds of functions it might serve. And if it arose to serve that function, what kind of design features might it have? So you think about the human mind as designed to you know, achieve a certain goal. And jealousy is a good one. So if, if we see jealousy all around the world, what functions might it serve and why, when might we expect jealousy to come online? So one interesting thing is, you know, people who are very young, they don't necessarily experience jealousy. And so for some people, they don't actually really experience jealousy until they're in their first serious relationship. There's a study that showed that, you know, young men, until they're in their first sexual relationship, they don't really understand jealousy. They don't answer questions as people who understand jealousy do. And then there's another way of, uh, of looking at the human mind, which you would think, okay, what's a problem that happened very commonly in human evolutionary history? What's a problem that people would have had to solve? And how would we have solved that? So one interesting problem that almost no one worked on, and I did a study on a few years ago, is on ectoparasites. So we don't think about this much because there's not very many ticks and lice and things running around. But... It's very common in non-human animals that they have these parasites on their skin all the time. And that's why, in part, you know, we're, we're living through this time of coronavirus. It's hard not to touch your face if you feel, you know, any twinge or anything from the environment on you. Because we evolved in an environment where if an organism got in your eye or in your nose or in your ear, it was really bad. And you wanted to prevent that. Now we don't live in an environment where there are these microorganisms as much. And so touching your face is more dangerous than not touching it. But that's not how it was all of our evolutionary history. So the study that I did was, okay, if we have sensitivity, skin sensitivity that is evolved for parasites, then we should expect it will be increased when we're disgusted. And so that's what we found is that skin sensitivity increases when people are disgusted, uh, looking at pictures of maggots or something. So those are two ways that you can find uh, possible evolutionary psychological mechanisms. Another way is to look mm-hmm. at non-human animals. So what are some things that we see in non-human animals and how might that manifest in humans? And you also have to think about um, problems and how frequent they were. So there's very low level frequency problems. So one problem that's not very frequent is for a man to have a baby born that he's taking care of and he's not sure is his. That's not a very high frequency problem. You wouldn't expect that to happen all the time, but <laughs> it, it's not like finding food, right? But it is a very important problem. Uh, whereas there's problems that don't happen that much uh, and they're not that important either. And then there's problems that happen all the time and they're very important. And there's problems that happen all the time and they're somewhat lower on importance. So in terms of the active parasites thing, I mean, depending on where you live, but this is a huge problem for, for non-human animals. And there's a vast literature about this in non-human animals and very little in humans. I did a big uh, literature review of disgusting stuff like nose picking and ear picking and asking people about stuff like that, which very few people do. Because it is just so close to the animal realm. And that's, that's one thing I love about evolutionary psychology is that seamless transition of trying to understand humans and trying to understand animals. 
now I, I do feel the urge to pick my nose and <laughs> control myself. <laughs> so um, this is interesting, but I always thought that this is still kind of a, a guesswork because you could come up with a really good reason that makes sense. And, and I wonder if there's a way for you to kind of know what is an actual adaptation and what is just a happy coincidence. Yeah, there are different standards of evidence for this. So there is a book called Adaptation and Natural Selection, and they talk about uh, how you have to see evidence of design. And it has to have evidence of design to serve a specific function. So something that happens, there's three main products of evolution. There's adaptations, there's byproducts, and there's noise. And there have been discussions about whether or not some aspects of human psychology are simply byproducts and whether some are just noise. So the, the biggest examples of noise, for example, are things like schizophrenia or obsessive compulsive disorder. They said, okay, maybe this is just what happens when you have a very high fever when you're young, that these mechanisms get overturned or they are not working correctly or with schizophrenia. So the evolutionary psychology community their interpretations of things like schizophrenia run the gamut from, okay, actually schizophrenia is a frequency dependent strategy to gain status in a particular way of having magical powers or whatever in specific kinds of, of cultures. Or you can say uh, it's, there's a viral uh, infection in the mother and then it actually causes these problems with theory of mind and with other psychological mechanisms. They go awry and there's no goal directedness. There's no possible positive benefit for having something like schizophrenia. Or schizophrenia is a byproduct of other good psychological uh, adaptations. Um, something I'm going to publish on my blog uh, today uh, talks a little bit about murder. So in evolutionary psychology, there's been a controversy about whether or not homicide is an adaptation or whether it's a byproduct. But wow. something like killing others, like in a goal-directed way or, or motivated reasoning, motivated cognition, ruminating about these things. I think you can't say that that's just noise or it's just something that happened uh, because it is goal-directed like many other, like trying to find food or considering engaging in courtship with somebody. So some people would say, unless you actually know the genetic basis of some characteristic, you can't say that it's an adaptation or unless you look at the gene frequency over time for some specific characteristic, you can't say it's the product of evolution. And I would say that that's a very, very high bar to clear. And there's lots of things that we take for granted that are adaptations or byproducts of adaptations without actually knowing what the genetic basis of those things are. Mm -hmm. um, I am curious about this murder, the, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on about murder. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, so in evolutionary psychology, there's a, 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 a couple of famous couples. There's Lita Cosmides and John Tooby, and there's Margot Wilson and Martin Daly. Mm -hmm. And Margot Wilson and Martin Daly wrote a book in the 1980s called Homicide. And they investigate all these different kinds of homicide from an evolutionary perspective. And from their perspective, homicide is a byproduct. So we have evolved to inflict costs on each other physically, but sometimes when we inflict costs on each other physically, we accidentally kill each other. And they also uh, talk about infanticide, which is the most common form of homicide. Uh, so women often kill their babies, especially in hunter-gatherer societies, women kill their babies a lot. So when you uh, said this is the most common form, uh, this is based on data, they actually observed these societies and yeah, counted at, the... Yeah, if you look at various different, um, like, uh, cultures, uh, infanticide is, is very common, the most common form. Although in other cultures, men kill each other also at much greater rates. You know, mm -hmm. in, in uh, I want to say in the Anoama and in other places like that, you know, one in 20 men are killed by, by homicide, but, you know, very common form of death. And so they, they do actually imply that, hom that infanticide might be ad adaptive. Like it's a way of, because almost all mammals uh, commit infanticide. If you've ever seen a hamster or a gerbil or whatever, um, those animals kill their babies all the time. There was, there was a, a, a laboratory that I used to work in 
And there was this woman who came in, she forgot to wash her hands after she petted her cat at home. And she worked with the hamsters in this laboratory. And then the next day she came in, the hamsters had freaked out because of the smell of the cat. They decided that it was not a good time to breed. And she came in and they had all eaten all their young. All the females were there alone without their young. Wow. So in, in humans, uh, infanticide is very common. And it, it can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, there's not enough investment. The woman is very young. Uh, something is wrong with the infant. Any variety of reasons. And so uh, David Buss came along and did a bunch of studies and said, actually, homicide is an adaptation. We actually have an adaptation to kill each other. Because if you ask people, you know, when they ruminate about somebody, they don't ruminate or think about how much they want to physically hurt that person as much as they often consider killing that person completely. Uh, and so he did a he did a, a popular book about this as well. But there was a a, a bit of a, a dialogue between them. And Martin Bailey and Margaret Wilson uh, at the time did say that you know potentially infanticide could be an adaptation itself. Yeah. My next question would be still staying on this topic, sure. but not about the animals, but more about let's say shifting to the to humans. And I want to understand if in your um, lifetime or during your career it it got harder to study evolutionary psychology do, do you have to uh, sidestep a lot more uh minds <laughs> land no. minds um I've, I've said many times that i mean people just don't think that you have bad ulterior motives as much if you are a woman as if you are a man I think that I get away with more. I can say more things. If I was to say women or men were superior in one domain or another, uh, intellectually, cognitively, whatever, then people would say that I was trying to, I don't know, that I, that I was trying to make men look better compared to women or that I was sexist or something. So I think mm -hmm. that that's uh, somewhat easier. I've also was in Britain most of the last 10 years. And in Britain, there's less of a, a, like a politically correct kind of climate. Uh, but in terms of evolutionary psychology, I think you don't want to be too salacious. So there was one professor who was talking about how um, women who are in the prime of their you know, peak, peak re residual fertility. So there's women who are like peak fertility, which is like around 25, 26 years old. And then there's women who have their peak residual fertility. They have the, the most fertility ahead of them, which are like 18, 19 years old. And I think he had pictures of girls in bikinis in his slides. Um, and he got in trouble for that, but he had gotten them from a female evolutionary psychology professor who just used her slides, right? And she never got in trouble for it. <laughs> so uh, there are certain things, you know, evolutionary psychologists, we tend to be a little bit irreverent. We tend to be, uh, there's a certain playfulness about it because it, it, some of these topics are so hot button that I think if we weren't highly open and pretty immune to controversy. We wouldn't get into things in the first place. So there's a kind of playfulness about, about outrage among many evolutionary psychologists. I can't say for all of them, but I don't know if it's gotten harder to be an evolutionary psychologist. Certainly on Twitter now, there are some really unpleasant people who hate evolutionary psychology, but they hate even asking questions from this perspective. If I was even to say, okay, I'm going to design a study uh, trying to figure out why women stay with men who abuse them from an evolutionary perspective even that question itself is offensive to them so even asking questions from a kind of ultimate or adaptationist perspective so really anything you come up with is going to be offensive to to such people yeah people do ask me silly things like you know is an evolutionary psychology just trying to represent the status quo uh, one funny interaction I had was this woman who said, uh, you know, evolutionary psychologists, they never study brown people. They just study like white undergraduates in the West. And then I, and they never study LGBT people. They never look at like whatever uh, non-heterosexuals. And there's a famous uh, researcher who looks at Samoans and the Samoans have a third gender, sort of. They're called the Fafafine. So they're men, they dress like women but they have sex with men and they take care of their, their nieces and nephews. And that's the one inclusive fitness reason for homosexuality. Basically the idea is that if you have a brother who's a Fafafine, 
you can have way more kids because they babysit all the time and they love their nieces and nephews. So they're a very big asset, like helper at the nest to their family. And this is one uh, common hypothesis about homosexuality that's been floating around forever, but it's only really ever been shown to work in, in the Fafafine. And then when I posted about this, people were like, oh, you know, you're, you're putting your terrible evolutionary psychology on the, these people, you're interpreting them in your own Western colonial lens. And so there's really no winning at all. <laughs> and the woman blocked me immediately after I was like, oh, look, there's this, this is some people who are non-Western that are being studied by evolutionary psychologists. And she said, uh, get the fuck out. And she blocked me. So. <laughs> it, it, it's very difficult to tell how widespread the, the outrage is. If you see how popular evolutionary psychology is in evolutionary psychology books, it just seems to be a small minority of people who are really aversive to evolutionary psychology. And I think it's because they don't want their behavior explained. I have a, I have, I'm working on something right now, which is basically uh, about the psychology of control, about how people don't want to be controlled and about this outrage at things like sex differences or ethnic differences is actually a way that people are trying to fight against the understanding of human psychology itself because they don't want to be understood. If you look at all of these debates about LGBT and trans people, even you know polyamory, Jeffrey's been interested in, in looking at polyamory, you'll say, okay, what do you identify as? You know, put yourself in a category. People don't want to be put in a category. They don't want to actually, they have problems with all the measures that you give them. They don't like <laughs> Uh, to say that they do things one way or another, that they feel one way consistently or another way. Because I think fundamentally right now, as psychology progresses, you're going to see more and more that people are trying to avoid and fight against being understood. And I think that's part of the rise of the whole, you know, non-binary thing is that, okay, if you say that there's sex differences, you say men and women are different in these particular ways and they have these different aptitudes, I'm going to opt out. I don't want to be understood in that way. So I'm going to say that I'm non-binary because non-binary is, is not, you know, not a natural kind. Right. Is it, I, I wonder, is it because they have a, a fundamental belief that the human nature is malleable or is it even not uh, philosophical like that, but simply just their personal egos that, oh, I can't be categorized like that. I can't be reduced to your formulas or your yeah. research papers. So I wonder if it's, if it's an ideological thing or just much more simple, well, ego-driven. The, the ideology comes from an ego-driven perspective. You know, I, mm. you're saying that, that men and women are on average like a certain, have certain aptitudes, have certain characteristics, have certain personality. I am non-binary. You can't actually categorize me. But also, I'm showing you that human nature is really, really complex and that you won't be able to understand me or anybody else. So it's a way of signaling that you're too complex to be understood by science where it is now, mm -hmm. but also, yeah, a way of evading control. And uh, people don't read B.F. Skinner that much. Uh, Skinner is like not popular at all anymore. 1950s, 1960s is very popular, but he, you know, he, he talked about this as well, that, that people are averse to being uh, controlled. And the reason that we can send men to the moon but we can't figure out how to get people to wash their hands with soap uh, is, is partly because people are, are evading control and it's difficult to understand people when you listen to their narratives about what they're like rather than just observing their behavior. If, if some, some time ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, I got into some trouble with uh, red pill people and um, I guess who hasn't? And I was simply trying to tell them um, I, I don't really have a dog in that fight uh, in any case, uh, but I was simply trying to tell them, look, um, you're trying to categorize people um, more rigidly than you should, and human behavior fits probably into some kind of a, not probably, it does fit into some kind of a distribution, right? And the distributions uh, between men and women overlap to a great extent. Um, so... My idea was that if I could somehow convey these ideas visually, like show them visually how these distributions overlap, uh, it would be a lot more powerful in convincing uh, people. But listening to you, it, it almost is futile. It's just they would come up with another 
um, rationalization that would reject that. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's interesting that there's this other aspect of, so there's people who say there are no categories, you can't categorize people, you know, everything is very, very complicated. If you look at something like Cordelia Fine's Delusions of Gender, or you look at um, Angela Saini, or you look at all of this, you know, the, the current debates about race science and things, people are like, oh, everything is incredibly complicated. There's no way of categorizing people. Mm -hmm. Everything is, is fluid. And you look at like the red pill people, they're like hyper reductionists. All men are either like alphas or betas. <laughs> That's the two yeah. categories of men. Yeah. <laughs> and all women are like Becky's or Stacy's. I can't remember that. There's a Stacy and there's a there's another one. Um, so or or like they're 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 ranked by the you know how attractive they are on a scale of one to ten or whatever the case may be. And so yeah, that's a hyper reductionism. And that's sort of a smug, I have a, an understanding of the world. And uh, it's funny because I've, I've been writing this book uh, called How to Train Your Boyfriend, which is about you know, behaviorism and evolutionary psychology. And uh, occasionally I get red pill people commenting on my videos saying, Yo, you're just taking stuff that red pill people said and recycling it. Women are always stealing ideas from men. <laughs> and, uh, and actually what I'm going to publish today is, a, is, a, is something I wrote back in 2007 where I started investigating these ideas. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, that's, I think, the, the opposite problem. Yeah, yeah, I think it, they both show the same amount of same lack of uh, um, maybe the ability or, or the willingness to understand life is um, not so, you know, in black or white. Yeah. And also, you're not that special that you cannot be understood by science. Uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe as an individual, it's hard. But what, what you do and what most scientists do aren't actually about you anyway, right? You're just talking yeah. about populations. Are you, are you still working on disgust? Uh, I have a couple of things on disgust that I uh, have to publish in the next year or so. Uh, one of them is on the disgust sensitivity of people who are asexual. Call it Paul, call it Paul, say very sexual. Uh -huh. um, so, one interesting thing about men and women is that women are more disgust sensitive than men, but women are much more disgust sensitive in the sexual domain. That is, uh, if you look at, at the three domains of disgust, which is one common way of looking at disgust uh, pathogen disgust, which is things like disease and food, mold on food, stuff like that, uh, moral disgust discussed at things like stealing or taking advantage of people who are uh, vulnerable. And then there's uh, sexual disgust, which is things like disgust at someone you're not attracted to fantasizing about you or overhearing people have sex. If you look at women, they tend to be more disgusted than men, but way more in the sexual domain. And so we were wondering if people who are asexual are also more globally disgust sensitive or if they're really just more sexually disgust sensitive. And it turns uh -huh. out they're really just more sexually disgust sensitive. And we also looked at like gay men and lesbians. And so we have a big sample of people. Um, and you know what, uh, this is a controversial thing to say, I don't know why, but uh, gay men have more feminine aspects of their psychology than, um, than straight men do on average. So another thing we were wondering about is are gay men gonna look more like women when it comes to their disgust sensitivity or are they gonna look more like straight men? Because it's going to be, they're going to be somewhere in the middle, is your uh, guess, but... Well, I thought they would be, yeah. Um, actually, for what I remember, gay men are very sexually disgust insensitive, but slightly more pathogen disgust sensitive than, uh, than, than straight men are. And then uh, <laughs> lesbians tend to be somewhat masculinized. So if, you're, if, you take, if you take it for granted, as I do, that gay men are somewhat more feminized on average than straight men, and gay women are somewhat more masculinized on average than straight women. Uh, bisexual women are not really uh, that, that easily, you know, they're not generally more masculinized, so just somewhat. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, some, that's something I work on and discuss at the moment, which um, I have to write that up. We have a big I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed that uh, uh, as far as uh, pathogen disgust is concerned, pathogen related disgust, let's say, um, why would there be any difference between the sexes? I mean, it's it's just as uh, important for either sex to not to eat something that's rotten and die. Um, yeah, there's a few possible reasons why women might be more pathogen disgust sensitive. Uh, one of them is that women show 
cyclic changes in their immune system that men do not. So when women are pregnant, the stakes for ingesting pathogens are higher. So like you inject, you know, you ingest something with pathogens, like you get a foodborne illness and you're a man, like you might be sick for a couple of days, right? But if you're a woman and you're pregnant and you ingest pathogens, then you might lose your pregnancy, which is a much greater loss for you. So the costs of potentially pathogens are greater for women than they are for men during pregnancy. And then also uh, when women are uh, naturally cycling, when they have menstrual cycles, there's some evidence that there's periods where their immune functioning is different because their body is getting ready to get pregnant. Uh -huh. And so, that was what I did my PhD on. It's, it, it may not be true. It has to be maybe replicated. The study that I did shows that women um, in the latter half of their menstrual cycle are more disgust sensitive. And some people have found it and some people have not. And so I'm doing a collaboration with some people, uh, a big disgust researcher called Josh Tiber, who actually is Jeffrey's former graduate student as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we're doing a collaboration to look at that. So, I mean, it could be that my whole dissertation is wrong. Which, you know, <laughs> it's it's too late happen. now. You're already a doctor, so it's you're fine. not going to take away that. Can't take away my PhD. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I I took a note here because I remember you were talking about this topic, and uh, you mentioned a study when um, uh, men when when men were aroused. Oh yeah. They don't feel as much disgust as women, right? Yeah. It was. Is there a reason for that? Yes. So uh, the other reason that women might be more disgust sensitive, just simply in the sexual domain, so now we're just going back to the sexual domain, is that women and men, just think about women and men's genitals. Women have basically a pocket and that pocket is not exposed to the air. It's interior, internal pocket. <laughs> and then men have a penis that sticks out. This is all very common knowledge, but uh, you have to kind of spell it out if you're gonna really understand it. <laughs> and uh, so what happens is just you know, purely, purely by function of what, what the sexual act, what intercourse is like, um, women are, are more likely to get tissue damage. And then also any pathogens they get will not be exposed to the air. They have a long time that they can invade the body. So if you look at like even mice having sex, mice, a male mouse has sex with a female mouse. She'll groom herself afterwards. So she'll like lick herself. He'll lick himself. But like, he can basically get everything from her off of himself in like a matter of seconds. She cannot, like just by virtue of her physiology. And the same thing is, is true of humans. Um, so that's one very simple reason why women are more um, sexually disgust sensitive. Uh, women are also more sexually disgust sensitive because there's a lot more things that can go wrong with the reproductive system in women. So if a woman gets chlamydia and it's untreated, she can become sterile. And all sexually transmitted infections have a greater bad effect, what they call disease burden, on women than they do on, on men. And if you look at HIV, uh, women are more likely to get it from a man who's positive, for example, than a, a man is to get it from a woman who's positive. So in all these mm -hmm. cases, because of just pure physiology. Um, and so that's one major reason. Another major reason is that women have, on average, you know, they can, they can have maybe six to eight children, like on the high end in their lives. Men can have hundreds of children, potentially. And so for a woman, each and every time that she chooses to engage in sex, there's a bigger portion of her reproductive success invested in that particular time. If a man has sex with a woman and she's like low genetic quality, he's high genetic quality, like what does it matter? He doesn't have to invest at all. But if a woman... It is by virtue of her physiology must invest yeah. completely. And so that's another reason why um, each shot that a woman takes is there's, there's, there's more associated with it. So for women, there's no, there's, there's no good reason for them to have sex um, just because, right? Like there is, like there is for men. So for men, if they have sexual opportunity, their disgust sensitivity is going to be lowered because the cost of getting disease is lower relative to the benefit that they can gain getting another right. chance of reproduction. Whereas for women, the cost of getting disease or, uh, or reproducing with, with somebody who's bad is, is huge um, at, relative to their investment. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you that the, the studies that are involved since I worked on this for a long time. 
So there's a, a Dan Ariely study, which is called In the Heat of the Moment. Mm -hmm. And they actually did something pretty intense, <laughs> which is they had young men come into the laboratory and they had them masturbate in the laboratory, but not so completion. They just had them keep themselves aroused and answer questionnaires while they touch themselves. So I think <laughs> people call Dan Ariely like the masturbation guy for like years and years. <laughs> he got paid for that. That's they, great. I mean, <laughs> professors get paid for all kinds of stuff. And they asked men all kinds of questions. Like, um, would it be exciting to have sex with a woman who's, these are men who are in their 20s. Would it be exciting for a woman uh, to have sex with a woman who's in her 60s? Do you want to see a woman urinate? Would you like to have sex with someone extremely fat? Would you like to have sex with somebody underage? Would you like to have sex with an animal? In all these cases, men were more excited or more willing to do these things when they were aroused than when they were not. Now, the exact same study has not been done in women, but the study that I did and some other people did is we, you know, you show women pornography, uh, you see how aroused they are, and then you ask them how disgusted they are in various different scenarios. And I also did a study where we had women watch pornography and we had them rate how likely they would be to kiss somebody who had a rash, on, like a guy who's very attractive, but who has a rash on his face. Mm -hmm. And women who are aroused really didn't show much difference from women who were, were not aroused. So it doesn't seem like when a man is aroused, it's an indicator that there is a clear and present opportunity for him to uh, reproduce. Uh, whereas for women, uh, those opportunities are so easy to come by that their psychology doesn't really make sense that they would change fundamentally. But you right. could check out um, Peter De Jong is this guy who did a study where um, they did it was an amazing study where they had women watch pornography and then they had them do like sexually disgusting tasks. So they said, uh, here's a pair of dirty women's underwear. <laughs> they weren't really dirty underwear. They put coconut milk in them. It, this is a very gross study actually. <laughs> well, you pick them up and put them in a hamper. <laughs> and uh, women were more likely to do that when they were out than when they were not. Right. I just realized that, you know, there's that phrase, um, post not clarity. Yes. I just realized this is related to that, that you yeah. suddenly realize, oh my God, what, what was I watching? <laughs> what I, watching? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that people talk about that as well. It's like, you know, you're watching something or somebody will be watching pornography, they'll have an orgasm, they close their computer. Then they open it the next day and they're like, oh my gosh, okay, that's where I was. I don't yeah, know, you know. You don't even that, need that much time. I mean, right <laughs> after, like, 30, <laughs> 30 seconds watch. later, well, the after. shame comes. <laughs> yeah, so so it is true that um, arousal tends to reduce uh, negative emotions generally. And that was another thing we looked at too. Long story, but um, we also tried to scare women and make them feel fearful and see if that had a change in their arousal. And uh, Weird, weird thing about women, if you scare them, they become more aroused. So <laughs> um, I had this uh, professor called Devendra Singh, um, who sadly died right after my dissertation, very well known professor from, from India. And he said that if you want to turn on your wife, uh, you should chase her around the kitchen table several times. <laughs> and it, it's weird, but true that if you show women like a, a thrilling uh, film, like a man chasing a woman down a dark alleyway, they will become more aroused to pornography afterwards. There's two different ways that we measure women's arousal and men's arousal. You could just ask people how aroused are you, but with women, it doesn't work quite the same way. So women will say that they're not aroused at all, but they're, um, they will show arousal in their vaginas. Basically in the study that we did, we flashed light inside. We had a probe, we flashed light in the women's vaginas and then, um, if they had more vasocongestion, if there was more blood flow, blood flow to that area. And that was the way that we measured arousal because the, women will say they're not aroused and subjectively. And um, when you use a measure, there's a difference between those two things. Whereas with men, men's objective or whatever the, the, the measurement of their penis, it actually very closely tracks what they say they're aroused and not aroused by. That's right. I mean, you can't lie anyway. So I guess there's. Yeah, there's I mean, no but women way. have no way of they they can't see what's going on in there. So that's yeah. Also, yeah. So that that's the best way. So the way I understand, I mean, this is not that important, but because yeah. I I used to be an engineer, it kind of. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it I can yeah, you yeah you would like it. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah. It's so, called it's called a vaginal photoplethysmograph. Uh huh. So it's like a tampon shaped device. There's a big um, uh, cable going towards it. 
And then um, what it does is it has, it shoots out light and then there's a light sensitive diode on the plexiglass, whatever it's called. And then um, the more the blood vessels are expanded, the less light comes back. Because the blood actually absorbs the light or mm -hmm. the vessels um, enlarge and that the, the cavity is- uh, The blood vessels, the blood vessels, like it, an engorged blood vessel absorbs more light. Okay, okay. Yeah. Cool, I wonder how yeah. they came up with that. It's pretty cool, yeah. Well, actually this is, when you mentioned fear, uh, it just reminded me that when I was um, uh, listening to you on Disgust, I, you were saying, I guess the general idea is of course that the Disgust is a tool um, to keep us alive. That's, it helps us uh, you know, be alive. Well, is, yeah, survive, reproduce, take care of our offspring, yeah, all that stuff, yeah. Right, um, well, I was, especially the, the pathogen kind of Disgust, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but absolutely. then, um, I was thinking, okay, why does it even exist? Because fear, doesn't fear have the same function? I mean, it is very strong. It keeps you alive. Um, yeah. Why don't we feel fear when we look at a warm infested food or a disgusting guy? Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying disgusting yeah. guy, but we could have said fear, uh, fearsome guy, let's say. Fearsome guy. Yeah, there's, there's a whole controversy around this. It's widely considered that human disgust is human only, so that other animals do not experience disgust. Now, you could say that there is disgust in non-human animals, but I, I worked with chimps for a while. The closest thing that you can see them looking disgusted by is uh, rain. They don't like to get wet. <laughs> uh, and they don't like snakes. That's basically it. They'll play with their own feces all day long, like they don't mind. Uh, and so they really have no disgust sensitivity. So with humans, disgust is different from fear. It actually has some of the similar physiological responses, um, but disgust is similar to fear in some ways, but we have our own facial expression for disgust that's different than, than for fear. And the idea is that we want to communicate to each other when something is disgusting. So there are other animals and they avoid things that are disgusting, but they don't convey to each other that something is contaminated the way that, that we do. And yeah, the idea is that disgust is a, is a human specific emotion. Now, doesn't fear work just as well? Potentially, um, there's some ideas that disgust is pretty new. So one possible a bit of evidence for that, as I just told you, is that chimps and bonobos and gorillas and orangutans, there's no evidence of disgust in those animals. Another one is that children don't really talk about things being disgusting or express disgust reliably until they're nine years old. Wow. So kids might say, that's yucky, I don't want that. They have like neophobia, like they don't want to try new foods, which is very common among all kinds of animals. But if you ask a child, like, what is that face? To, to say something is a disgust face or to make a disgust face or to say that is disgusting, like in a consistent way, they're pretty old before they could do that. So and for other emotions, they can. For other yeah, expressions, so kids, they're pretty kids, good. Kids show fear and happiness and anger way earlier then they show disgust. Is that kind of a consistent thing that if something happens, um, comes online later in a developmental stage, does it mean that also it evolved later? Is it always well, closely it, matching? It, it's a little bit complicated because there's emotions that we don't have that come online until, because they're sexual emotions. So like jealousy and sexual arousal. Right. Sexual arousal is super old. I wouldn't say that because you don't experience sexual arousal until you're 12, that means it's a new thing. Yeah, um, yeah. But because disgust is a survival emotion and it comes on so late, that's that's my implication for it. Not not everybody would agree with me about that, though. That's a kind of ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that uh -huh. the order in which you see things happen in, in the human cognition, uh, like moral stages, indicates how, you know, how much of your brain, like your new brain, your, your human brain needs to be developed before you can experience it. Right. Um, and also, does it mean that if you if you leave the kids to their own devices, they would just uh, play with their crap uh, <laughs> and, and they don't get disgusted? They think it's okay. Um, there's a very interesting hypothesis, like about toddlers. Okay, so toddlers, like they put everything in their mouths. They mouth lots of things. Yeah. And one hypothesis for this is that um, toddlers in our ancestral past, children would have been breastfed till they're about three or four years old. 
And when you're breastfed, you don't just get milk from your mom, but you also get her antibodies. So you get her immune uh, cells. So one possibly good thing about putting everything in your mouth is that your mom's immune cells are gonna attack those things and then you're gonna have an immunological memory. So it's like you're vaccinating yourself against common pathogens in the environment yeah. by sticking stuff in your mouth and then using your mom's milk to vaccinate you against all the stuff that you're sticking in your mouth. That's one, one possibility. Another one is that there's a, a so-called sensitive period where children eat basically anything that you put in front of them. And because humans survive all over the world, it's important that we're flexible enough um, in order to learn to eat all kinds of different foods. So all of us like foods more that we were exposed to when we were younger. It's hard to like new foods. Like I was just in China for a month and I'm usually vegan, but uh, I was not vegan in China because it was impossible. And I was eating all kinds of weird shit. And, um, and so it's much more difficult uh, because of that sensitive period. So yes, children, there might be an adaptive reason why Disgust doesn't come online so that you can learn to like foods that are nutritious in your environment. Uh-huh. Because if we were locked in to eat specific foods, we wouldn't be successful all over the world the way that we are. Yeah, it, I guess it's it's a, a delicate balance between risk and reward. Um, yeah. But I, it only takes, I mean, even if 90% of people would die um, and 10% would succeed, they can just, um, you know, by taking that risk, they can repopulate that part of the world with a new diet. And well, we're their children probably. Um, I can't remember if it's been debunked or, or what, but you know, Jared Diamond, who's written Guns, Germs, and Steel and Collapse, uh, and other people have talked about, there were people who colonized parts of the world. I think that the, the, the people who colonized Greenland and they didn't eat fish. And so they died because they didn't eat fish. They, they starved to death because there was a very bad winter. They started eating their calves, uh, you know, their very young livestock. And if they had just gone fishing, but they thought fish was poison. I think this is in Collapse by Jared Diamond. And so, you know, this kind of thing happens when people colonize new places is that uh, they're too scared to eat what's nutritious there. There's a theory that racism could be related to the diseases that were, um, yeah. that could be introduced to the group by the, by the out group, right? Yeah. And I don't think you like this opinion, this, this theory that much. I used to love it. I used to think it was the best possible example. The first idea was that out group members might carry novel pathogens that you're not prepared for. And that's why uh, you would be disgusted by them. Uh, the other possibility is that disgust is not really an emotion that's always specifically for disease. So you might be disgusted because they have different practices, uh, like traditions, that might not be optimal in the current environment. So rather than discuss necessarily at pathogens, it's like discussed it. You know, it, it is also to do with pathogens, like the way they cook food in the environment might not be the best way of doing so. You don't wanna take on their other uh, cultural traditions. Um, Josh Tiber's been working on this as well. And I saw him give a really great talk about this, essentially saying that if, if you're dealing with a new group of people, they're less likely to invest in you significantly and discuss might be a way of not investing too much in them. So not getting too close to them. Uh, but it's, it's really unclear. It's quite a complicated story still uh, at the moment. And there's not a great indicator of uh, ethnocentrism and xenophobia it don't seem to be as correlated with disgust sensitivity as we thought. So isn't is not true if uh, uh, if a woman is ovulating, are they more uh, discuss sensitive to uh, strangers, or is it more of a fear response? It's more of a fear response. I did work uh -huh. on this as well. It's more of a fear response, and then you know we were interested in is there like a almost a preference for the out group? So there's this thing called hybrid vigor, where you want somebody who's got different genes from you yourself uh, to mate with. Uh, because potentially your offspring will have, you know, better outcomes. And uh, we were curious if women were more attracted to men who were like mixed race when they were ovulating. We just asked women about this. And no, we didn't find that. We actually found that they were, they were more afraid of them. Uh, but, but this, this was, was a study back in like, this is like a 15-year-old study, I think, that uh -huh. I did with uh, Carlos Navarrete and Dan Fessler. Uh, the, the ovulation stuff is another area that's been like really in flux. 
where we thought we had a pretty consistent story about ovulation. And then a bunch of people came along with, with bigger data sets and with more uh, sophisticated methods and said, you know, women are not necessarily advertising when they're ovulating. And the evidence that women are avoiding dangerous men or men that might be dangerous when they're ovulating is actually somewhat better than that women are advertising their fertility when they're ovulating. You know, when you talk about uh, uh, dangerous men, I just re uh, remember this uh, bad boy effect. Yeah, I, I talk about this in, you know, one way of looking at the distilled preferences of men and women is to look at the media that's made for men and women. If you look at pornography, what are some very common themes? Common themes in pornography are very women with very sexually exaggerated features, women who are very interested in having sex without any signs of commitment, and women who are interested in doing sexually adventurous things with kind of whoever comes along, right? And if you look at women's pornography, romance novels and genres like that, uh, things like slash fiction, uh, like things that like Catherine Salmon studies, what you'll see is that, yes, women actually do really like certain kinds of characteristics in the protagonists, the male protagonists. So things like, yeah, um, well, well, you know, what's, what's a vampire like? Vampires are kind of a narcissistic, uh, sociopathic character, but a, a vampire like in Twilight loves the protagonist, is very kind to her, but is really terrible to other people and really imposes himself on other people. And there's, you know, there's other taboo stuff that people, uh, I haven't looked into this very deeply, but there seems to be evidence that violent pornography, like pornography where women get slapped and, and have really rough sex and stuff is actually being disproportionately consumed by women now. Wow. Nobody likes I... to hear about that, but that seems to yeah. be the case. So these things are not really in keeping with the, consistent narrative about what women want. But I think that it's very interesting to look at what, what preferences are like when nobody's watching. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is, uh, if we can tie this to evolutionary psychology in some way, but I noticed that recently, um, you know, when I look at uh, porn sites, the dominant theme is sister-in-law, brother-in-law yeah. type of stuff. And that it's wasn't- a fad. It's just a fad. It's, it's like, just a, there's like there was there's there's always like fads in, in pornography that just appeal to you know so one thing that you'll see in any context where humans are neophilic so we're neophilic in that we like newness we like variations on a theme right you a song that you've listened to for a long time you're gonna love the remix mm -hmm. and I think that like sister in law stuff is just like a remix of basically taboo sexual encounters or a novel way of looking at it. For many years, what was popular, uh, women dressed in like video game costumes. So that was like something you liked in one domain and smashed together with something from another domain. And then it, it was like a remix of your favorite song. I think this is a kind of similar thing. I don't okay. think you necessarily read too much into the specifics of it, just that it's a new variation on an old theme. Deborah Lieberman, who looks at uh, incest avoidance uh -huh. in humans. And she did a fascinating study where she put a camera on men's faces and she said, how much would you like to French kiss your sister? And if a man had a sister, he made a disgust face. But if a man didn't have a sister, he was like. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> he smile. He's like, what if I did have a sister? So people who have a, a opposite sex sibling are more disgusted by these kinds of thought experiments and people who do not have an opposite sex sibling. And so it's possible that like men who don't have an opposite sex sibling are driving the, the demand for this. They find it a little bit exciting and taboo because they don't have any disgust associated with it. I think if you really did have a, a stepsister um, that you had been raised with, who you were not attracted to, this would like potentially be not very exciting as a genre. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got one question here related to this bad boy theme and I, I noted it down, I really wanted to ask you, so I'll go back to that. Um, I think you were saying in one of these interviews that maybe there's a theory that in volatile environments, um, um, basically having an asshole in your corner is an advantage, right? 
um, it will just screw the other people, uh, cheat them out of their food, whatever. It will, it will bring you some advantage. But I was thinking that um, we're not really now in volatile environments, right? We have laws and rules, regulations, things like this. We don't have as much of an incentive to form alliances right now. In other words, if I'm an asshole, I can, I can just live my life uh, pretty much okay. Uh, it won't be an enriching life, but I won't starve to death. I'll just have a job. I'll go to the supermarket. You know, there are laws. I don't need anybody's help um, because there's a system in place. Um, but, you know, in a, in a volatile environment, in a natural volatile environment, you really need an alliance, right? You need, it's a numbers game. So it, it, it's, it's almost an in, inverse um, incentive for me. Because the guy has to be even nicer, or at least less of a sociopath, mm -hmm. to be able to form an alliance in that kind of an environment, so that he can take care of his offspring better. So when people talk about a volatile environment, and if you look at real volatile environments, places in the developing world, for example, where you know there are no contracts, yes, alliances and loyalty are very important. But so too, is it important to not invest too much in people who you're not really allied with? And you take as a cue of your environment, how often people, for example, renege. So mm -hmm. you were talking, uh, there, there's just some stuff about father absence. Nowadays, people think the father absence effect is potentially, is, is more likely to be genetic. So uh, rather than you're growing up, your father leaves, it's a cue to you that people don't stick around and that alliances are ephemeral or they're not long lasting. Rather than that, you just have the same genes as the person who ran off. And therefore you're less likely to form longstanding committed relationships like a, like a long lasting uh, marriage. So I see what you're saying about volatile environments, uh, but what you, what you actually do see in these volatile environments is an increase in things like psychopathy, sociopathy, and their manifestations. Now, you're going to see a, a, some small percentage of people all, all the time who have psychopathy. Uh, sociopathy is considered to be more environmentally mediated, whereas psychopathy is considered to be more genetic. There's still mm -hmm. people working on that right now. But one idea is that in a modern environment where it's easy to go from place to place to place, and you can move on to a new group and exploit a new group. These men who are psychopaths, they have one family, they have sex with a woman, they make babies with her, and then they move on. And they're actually able to be more successful in a modern environment, which has like less word of mouth about who's bad and who's good. And so it's possible that there's a greater percentage of psycho psychopaths, even though it's still quite a small percentage, but there's a greater percentage in the modern environment than there would be in uh, an environment where it was more difficult to exploit a community because of more face-to-face -face interactions and mm -hmm. more word of mouth. I mm -hmm. don't know if that answered your question at all. No, I, got, I, I understand it. Um, but th this is actually quite interesting that you touched upon this um, fathers who are the you know, absentee fathers. Yeah. Because um, I was, I guess a lot of people are thinking that it's, it's something that could be fixed by social policies and emphasis on family values and things like that. Um, whereas you're saying that the research is more like, well, that's, that's kind of the destiny. It's the, it's too bad. <laughs> it's too bad. It's too bad. The research says it's too bad. <laughs> yeah, it is too bad. Uh, people do get really upset about it because it has bad ramifications. So mm -hmm. what the conservative right in the United States is saying is that uh, there are some groups of people, for example, African-Americans where men are, disproportionately put in prison and children are raised without a father figure. And the one idea that they were thinking of is, is uh, you know, if you just were able to keep these fathers around, if you gave people an incentive to stay married, for example, government incentives to stay married, if the father stuck around, then that would actually have a huge positive influence on these kids and that their kids would be less likely to be criminals and, and uh, girls would be less likely to get pregnant at a young age. All of the problems that these communities have and then when you actually look at um, 
these studies, it doesn't seem, I mean, I don't know if the studies have been done specifically in the African-American community. I know that there's a woman uh, who you guys can follow on Twitter called Nicole Barbaro, who's a really mm -hmm. great evolutionary psych person. And she's really done a deep dive into this. And she basically thinks that the whole father absence effect has been overblown in part because of the positive ramifications it has that we can change some of these bad, uh, bad outcomes with social policy. I think, I see. That, yeah, it's, it's just really difficult uh, to figure out exactly what's going on here. We are talking about certain people not having the genetic makeup to be good parents or good fathers, let's say. Um, that's probably because um, monogamy and staying, you know, in, in, a, in a relationship, being a good father and good husband, uh, and I'm talking from the guy's perspective, uh, mostly, is the standard. And is it because this is a cultural norm um, due to religion and, you know, the post-agricultural uh, revolution? That was a good thing to do to have people in families so that single men don't go around and cause trouble? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways of making a living as a man and, and as a woman. I think as a woman, there's somewhat fewer ways of making a living. So for men, there are men who are very high status. And the you know 80% of societies, if you do a survey, have been to some extent polygynous. And polygynous means more than one wife for those men who are very high in status. Now, in many places in the world, children survive much better if they have provisioning from their father. That means both that they're kept safe from other men, but also that they're given resources and food and other things that they need in order to grow up and safety. So in our species, it's not, you know, these, these, these masculine ideals of taking care of your children adhere very well to one very successful strategy as a man, which is to provision his offspring. One very good strategy for a man to pursue is with one woman or maybe more than one woman to take care of his kids as carefully and, and studiously as he can. There's another strategy, which is to kind of sp spread your genes around. And that's a strategy that can't be pursued by everybody. It can be pursued by, by chads if we want to get back to the red pill. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that you can do yeah. um, if you're very attractive and somebody is willing to exchange the chance of raising your offspring uh, with the, you know, with the gamble of not having enough uh, provisioning. But there are many places in the world in which children need very little provisioning where, you know, there's like ample food. And there's not really a whole lot of reason for men to stick around. There are some places where there's not a huge amount of difference between a kid who has a father figure around and one, one who doesn't. So if you look at these cultural tropes about what a good dad is or what a cat is or what a good husband is, they follow fairly closely to what a particular successful strategy looks like uh, when pursued by, by men. If you look at fish, for example, in the in the kingdom, uh, not the kingdom, but in among fish, uh, females take care of their offspring less often, oftentimes than, than males do. Males take care of the offspring more. Why is that? Well, because the females lay their eggs, and then the males fertilize those eggs with sperm. And by the time they're done fertilizing those eggs with sperm, the females are gone. And so, if anybody's going to defend the the clutch, it's going to have to be males. So males have evolved this provisioning, uh, just because that's they're the ones left holding the bag of eggs as it were and so mm. if you look at culture and you look at cultural engineering in my view it, it's all downstream from biology right and is it you think that let's say if he, if this this world was a simulation and we ran it like 10,000 times and in each of them would it be a deterministic result um, um so to speak that we would end up with this current setup where oh no there's all kinds of random things that happen. Um, you know, if you look at the way that the women's reproductive system is organized, it's, I think, one of the single best pieces of evidence against God. <laughs> it's just <laughs> ter terribly put together. Um, or maybe it's the sin of Eve, I don't know, but something, something happened along the way. So there do seem to be some kinds of accidents. Um, if we did external fertilization, if there was some kind of accident along the way there, or we didn't evolve a certain way, 
Uh, but you know, th th there does seem to be a lot of convergence on this two sex model, male and female. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that male and female is defined all over the animal kingdom is that the female is the one who has the bigger gametes and more often than not invests more. If you were to run a simulation, and I do enjoy the idea of running a simulation uh, where you evolve humans over and over and over again, uh, I think that you would come up with uh, these sex roles and similar uh, psychologies in terms of sexual psychology and child-rearing psychologies mm -hmm. yeah, quite, quite many times because it has been the way that other animals have also evolved, even really weird ones. Right, so what I have in mind is let's let's keep biology constant, right? Let's say the 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 mate selection strategy or or your basic biology is the same. Yeah. But um, as far as I know, you can correct me on this. There are different strategies in within primates, within yeah. uh, you know higher primates, right? So in certain groups, for instance, women are more females are are more dominant because they have more alliances and. Mm -hmm. I know three or four women can gang up on a guy and then guys are yeah. just not good at, uh, yeah. you know, forming alliances for some reason. Yeah. They're idiots. Yeah. Uh, whereas in a human society, in, in every society almost, it's the guys that were in charge for a long time. Um, um, so, yeah, if you look at bonobos, there, there's this idea that in bonobos there's kind of matriarchy. In that partly because females have sex with each other, they form alliances and then they can overpower males. So males tend to be bigger and stronger. But in bonobos, they're actually very promiscuous. So instead of males beating each other up for access to females, what happens instead is that males um, compete inside of females. They have big balls, they have do sperm competition, and many uh -huh. males have sex with females. They do chase each other off sometimes, but beating each other up is not the primary way that they compete for females. Whereas in gorillas and other animals, that's the primary way that they do. And so when you on that kind of track uh, where males actually use their physical force to beat each other up, then you also get on a track towards uh, patriarchy because that makes males bigger and stronger than females and size and strength are the foundational power and the ultimate power. So right. it, it's, not, it's not the size and strength that it occurs in a vacuum. It is also comes with that ambition and motivation uh, to have the leadership position because that is the most sexually successful position. Right. Then, yeah. then I would modify my previous question as such. Let's say we have our current biology. Yes. Um, could we have gone the route of the bonobos? Um, as in, maybe we would have a society in the you know way early, way in the beginning, yeah. where everybody would have sex with each other, and I wouldn't know who's my son and daughter. Yeah. Um, that's why I would just invest in everybody. So the whole group takes yeah, there, there are models like that. I don't know. I mean, so these other species, their um, young are better formed and less needy. They grow up faster than our young do. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there has something to do with that, where if you have young that take a long, long time to develop and that are born so helpless, and also those, all those organisms live in very warm and tropical places where it's fairly easy to make a living compared to like, I don't know, the Arctic or other colder places. Yeah. So, um, you can imagine that these would cause disparities such that, you know, bet between those species and our species in which investment was really absolutely necessary. Uh, so as I said, there are some cultures in which uh, it doesn't matter that much if kids don't know who their dads are. Um, it's pretty safe and there's, there's pretty plentiful food. And there are some places where you know, if you don't have safety or there's there's nobody to provision you, you will die. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that by virtue of us being all over the world uh, as a species, we've converged on something that's pretty stable in terms of investment. Mm -hmm. The amount of investment differs from place to place though. But I find it difficult to imagine other ways that it could work uh, all over the world, especially in very resource depleted environments and dangerous environments. Right. And what about the future? So I don't know how much you you guys speculate on the future rather than uh, checking out the evolutionary path. We are kind of moving towards this universal basic income uh, structure, especially now with the coronavirus, you know, people are experimenting. So it's almost like the government is uh, has become the father figure, you know, 
in full because now our protection comes from there and all the resources are provided by that, right? So in this kind of, let's say this runs for the next 50 years, do you think it would change the basic um, you know, male-female dynamics or is it just too short of a time and our evolutionary baggage is too strong? I think people have already said that, for example, single mothers getting welfare benefits makes it such that women are less reliant on men. And because women initiate something like 75% of divorces, that wow. when you offer women huge benefits for separating from, from fathers, that you're actually incentivizing women to be single mothers. That could be the case. I don't actually know how responsive people are to financial incentives when it comes to relationships. I think there, there could be many different things at, at play. In terms of, of UBI, uh, I think that because of the legacy of eugenics, people are very averse to telling people how many kids they can have and you know, who they should have children with. And uh, I've written something about this, which will come out probably in the next year. But what I think is uh, going to happen is that there's going to be uh, people doing embryo selection, potentially. They're going to be using their money to have the best children possible and that the government's actually not going to have to intervene. People are going to choose to have better genetic offspring if they can when the technology is there and, and when it's uh, cheap enough. So I think that that's going to be a major change in the future. Um, if you have uh, UBI, uh, I also think that people might not, you know, might choose not to have children if they have UBI, uh, because in part, in many places in the world, people have kids as insurance, you know, for their right. future. There would be somebody to look after them, for example. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it's very complicated because I, I really don't know how much these kinds of decisions do respond uh, to incentives. You know, they, they've tried to incentivize certain things, like in, in Scandinavia, they've tried to incentivize um, women... Uh, taking maternity leave and then coming back to work. And then oftentimes women are choosing to, to stay with their children instead. So it does seem like there's a, a, a natural pull for people to do uh, what, what men and women have been doing for, for thousands of years. So it, it yeah. is difficult to predict. Yeah, it's almost like if the, if the society is, gets uh, you know, progressive enough, it turns a corner where all the basic needs of the people are met. And then when your basic needs are met, then you kind of go back to your natural uh, uh, priorities. Yeah. yeah. What and I'm really becomes... hoping is going to happen is that something I think is terrible, and I talk about this all the time, is that uh, you know people live in like nuclear families and they live all alone. And I think with UBI, it would be very easy for a huge group of people with with many children to form a, a group and live like in a large house on an allotment place with gardens, something like that, where their money pooled together could lead to them having a very good life with a lot of very natural communication, camaraderie, mm -hmm. affiliation, cooking meals together, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody working and everybody making money has led to this kind of runaway consumer culture where everybody has their own homestead and their own stuff. So I really do hope that some people will come along and say, look, I'm going to make a, a UBI apartment complex, a place for all these people to live together communally, where your UBI will, you know, given that everybody's making the same amount of money, uh, will mean that everybody can have a really good and, and lifestyle. But yeah, UBI is a real, a real game changer. If you look at the history of kind of communist countries, uh, when there was very little difference between what, I don't know, a mechanic made and a professor made, then people tried to stick out by consuming in various different ways, by buying difficult to buy things, by collecting um, unusual art when they could. Everybody always wants to try and signal that they're different from everybody else. And that I think will, will carry on. But I, I think it would be wonderful if people would take their UBI and live a really full human life, full of communicating, making art, being creative, enjoying people's company, uh, something more close to how our primate relatives live than how we live now. I was also thinking because of this, this um, relative comfort, maybe the traditionally you know, uh, male associated, masculine associated uh, properties or, or characteristics would be devalued, right? I, I don't have to be manly man anymore to be in demand. Well, 
there's a certain ambition that women like, you know, somebody who wants to make a lot of money who is, I don't know, in certain subcultures, people with a flashy car or whatever. But there's certain very conventional and traditional manly virtues, like being able to build a house or do your own plumbing or farm or grow food or whatever. Those kinds of even older masculine virtues that I think are going to make a comeback because those are things that are priceless. Mm -hmm. right? Those that's are things true. you don't have to do with conspicuous consumption. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. If you... Yeah, if you dial back on the globalism in that sense, uh, and if you cannot get everything from Amazon, you try to be more self, you know, self-sufficient. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I got another question with zero segue, and it's about humor. Is something like, or even human intelligence as a whole, is something like a uh, peacock tail um, is basically a signal, right? And it's a costly signal. Yeah. Um, but, and I, and I was thinking when I heard this, okay, is, I understand that to a certain extent, intelligence correlates with your survival um, ability and also, okay. you know, yeah. parental ability, but is it correlated um, indefinitely? I mean, at some point, intelligence always mm -hmm. uh, almost actually works against you, right? It makes you depressed uh, sometimes, or um, maybe more realistically, if you're intelligent enough, then it's harder for you to form um, groups because you're not going to be indoctrinated uh, as easily. So you don't have this group cohesion. Mm -hmm. So you're not as strong as a, as a society. From what I've heard, the, the idea that at very high levels, IQ has serious drawbacks, I think has not been proven in any way, shape or form. It's just our, <laughs> it's just our interpretation. Cause if you meet somebody, if you meet somebody who's, really, really smart, and they are neurotypical other than being a genius, right? Then you won't know. They're not going to say stuff to you that you can't possibly understand. The people that you meet who stick out like a sore thumb because they're geniuses are also people who have other psychological problems. Right. So your kind of sample size about people who are very, very smart is skewed to those people who are very smart that you've met who are also very eccentric. Because otherwise you wouldn't even notice unless you watch somebody do math or something that they happen to be very, very smart. Yeah, I mean, humor is a, is a practical signal in a variety of ways. Yeah, it's about theory of mind, but also says how much somebody understands you. So somebody uh -huh. can't really make you laugh that well unless they, they have to have a sense of you. You know, I, I, there's some jokes that I tell to some kinds of people, some jokes that I tell to other kinds of people. Also... I'm sure you guys do this in, in Turkey as well. When you tease somebody, you have to know how close your relationship is before you can make fun of somebody uh, in a way that they might find endearing. And if you right. do it too soon, it's really off-putting. So these are kind of high stakes social interaction games that people play. And it is a conspicuous signal because there's so many things that can possibly go wrong. Absolutely. Are, um, are gay women funnier than straight women? Some people say so. If you look at stand-up, uh, there's a disproportionate a number of, of women who are uh, gay or, or bisexual, or whatever. Um, uh, there's a stand-up series on YouTube that I really like, which is called This Is Not Happening, where people tell personal stories. And I have to say that on those, I thought the women's stories were on average better than the men's stories. So I think that it, part of it is that stand-up has not been that much about like you know personal narratives. It is to some extent. But if you have something specifically about, I'm going to tell you a story that happened in my life, women have better autobiographical memory and they're way, way funnier, um, in my view, in this yeah. domain of humor but, than men are. Uh, whereas, but, you know, most of my other favorite stand-up comedians are, are men. The idea of effective altruism, what is the actual goal? Is the actual goal the maximum amount of sentient beings experiencing the maximum amount of happiness? When you put it in an abstract way like that, it sounds crazy. But yeah, the, the optimal thing is that there are as many beings experiencing as much pleasure and as little suffering as possible. So for most people, their intuition is that reducing suffering is more important than increasing pleasure. And there's so much suffering right now that, that our work is really you know, cut out for us. So if you think about effective altruism, yeah, the objectives are to increase the number of years or number of days of well-being and humans and, and other sentient beings. 
So, okay. And one of the ideas you had is that eat less chicken and eat more cows oh, instead. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, 200 chicken provides the same amount of uh, nutrition as one cow and yeah. a chicken and a cow are not that different. Uh, so I'll have a blog digestive. coming out on this soon on, on Dianaverse because I wrote a whole chapter and this features very prominently in the chapter. But if you are going to eat meat or if you're going to eat it all, which all of you have to eat, you want to think about the number of days of suffering that go into the food. So it's complicated to some extent to think about, you know, how much does a catfish suffer? How much does a fish suffer? How much does a chicken suffer? How much yeah. does a cow yeah. suffer? And you also have to think about the kinds of lives that they lead. Uh, but by my view, uh, a chicken that's raised for food has a really terrible life for a variety of reasons. They're raised in these kind of ammonia filled sheds. Uh, their legs are often not, cannot withstand their weight because they're specially bred. Um, some of them have their beaks cut off in order that they don't peck each other. And their lives are really pretty terrible. And I don't think that they have much happiness in their lives. Where if you look at a, a beef cow, they're raised, they stay with their mother, they're with others, they, they graze. Then the last two weeks of their life, they're on what's called a feedlot, where they're eating as much grain as they can to fatten them up. And people like Temple Grandin and others have said, uh, for a beef cow, they have one bad day. The, the bad day is the day they get slaughtered. <laughs> and yeah. so if you think that suffering is important, which I think most people do intuitively, you want to try and reduce the number of days of suffering per kilo of meat or calorie that you, uh, that you eat. You know, if you found out tomorrow that all of the people who pick the chocolate that you enjoy in, in a chocolate bar uh, were slaves. And then you found out that there was another chocolate bar that tasted uh, similar, or at least had the same you know, pleasure that it could give you, uh, where everybody was paid a living wage and they weren't that big difference in, in cost, then you would choose to eat the one that, that involved less suffering, I should hope. And similar when you think about you know, meat or, or um, other animal products, uh, for example, milk is very low on suffering. A, a cow produces millions and millions of calories in her life, uh, but eggs are very high on suffering. Chickens suffer terribly when they lay eggs, and uh, they suffer terribly during their lives uh, as, as egg-laying hens, and plus they kill all the males. So do check out the, the animals that you eat, not just their lives, but also how big they are makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, a chicken whose life was, was pretty good, uh, as good as a cow's life, would still only give you one two hundredth of the meat that, that a cow would give you. All right. So the thing that makes this very interesting for me is uh, from the, in the context of um, uh, climate change, usually uh, cow is not eating, you know, consuming cows are not, uh, uh, is not promoted because it's less efficient. You know, when the animal gets bigger, it becomes less and less efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the, there's something called the feed ratio, you know, how much feed you put in the animal and how much calories you got. You get out the fish are the best it's almost one to one yeah. and then you know chickens are better than cows uh pigs are better than cows so it's it that's one uh incentive and this goes in the opposite direction wait you know climate change is not the only thing we should be worrying about well-being of sentient beings is also me, important thinking about climate change i don't usually go into this because it's so controversial but i'm i'm what you would call a lukewarmer so I believe that humans are causing climate change, anthropogenic climate change. I agree that it's happening. I just don't know exactly if that climate change is going to have some benefits, like, for example, making some places warmer than they are now. Uh, there has been periods in, in history where parts of Europe were much warmer than they are now, where you could grow grapes wherever you can't grow them at the moment. But also, I'm just not sure in terms of sentient beings, like in terms of the, the world, if climate change is going to make everything suffer so much that I should eat something that has 200 times the suffering now. Uh, yeah. Obviously, best, the best of all worlds is that you become vegetarian and you stop eating eggs, that you, you eat, you know, that you drink milk and eat cheese if you want to, but otherwise that you're vegan. That's obviously the lowest suffering footprint and also the lowest carbon footprint way to eat. And if that's what you care about, uh, that's great. For me, I encourage people to eat beef over chicken because I think that the influence of climate change is not going to increase uh, the amount of suffering in the world relative to how much suffering you increase in the world 
by deciding to eat chicken over beef. I understand. Okay. So then I wrap this up with uh, kind of a qu crazy question. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's not that crazy, but it's limited. It's, it's related to this. So I was wondering what are the limits of this utilitarian sentientist? Oh uh, yeah. Super easy question. So easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me let me put it let me put it this way. If we were living, if we had this ability to grow chicken, um, well, you know, uh, have these unlimited chicken farms where chicken are not suffering, but instead they're let's say they're injected with uh, um, heroin, it's something that makes them happy. I don't know if <laughs> they're talking about matrix chickens too, like where you keep them in a matrix and then, or you know, we're we're gonna have in vitro meat or clean meat soon you're gonna be able to grow their cells you won't even right but actually the, the matrix chickens are even more interesting because then the it's it's almost like as a as a an effective altruist your goal should be to increase the happiness now that you have eliminated the suffering and now there's only the upside and if you have the technological ability to hook up the chickens to the uh the matrix or whatever you know you you should have yeah. trillions and trillions of chickens Having happy lives. I just don't think that, uh, I mean, not that I've known very many chickens, but I think that the <laughs> deepest happiness a chicken experience is much less than the deepest happiness that like, I don't know, like a, a dog can experience. Uh -huh. Like chickens are just not, they just don't have a huge uh, range. Uh, uh, you know, right. even happy chickens are happy, uh, but a happy chicken uh, that has, you know, the run of my backyard is uh, is not going to be that much less happy than a chicken that I don't know I spend all day um, toasting corn seeds for <laughs> whatever like right, right. <laughs> um, but you you could apply this question to the, the humans uh, if we had the ability yeah. to if you could choose to have like twenty billion humans or even virtual minds connected to the matrix then um, would you stop being an effective altruist at that point or say, no, you know, go for it. Let's just max. Oh yeah. I effort. mean, I, I'm happy to bite bullets. Uh, that's, a, that's an American idiom to bite a bullet mm -hmm. is to, <laughs> to take on a, a bad outcome or a potentially unpalatable outcome of some thought experiment. Yeah. I'm happy to bite bullets. Uh, I don't think there's very much that would make me a, a non, not an effective altruist or, or not sympathetic to that cause. Certainly there's things that I feel emotionally against, even though I know they're okay. Like, so I know several people who agree with the vegetarian and vegan message, but instead of being vegetarian or vegan themselves, they uh, pay money to vegan outreach. So other people will be vegan instead of themselves, mm -hmm. right? The first time I heard that, I thought that was sociopathic and like the worst thing I've ever heard, <laughs> like buying indulgences. I thought it was really terrible. And now I think that's probably fine. We've just gotten used to it. So yeah, I think that if you have a real consistent philosophical view, you're going to run into problems because your evolutionary psychology, your evolved psychology is not intended to be consistent. It's going to have lots of, of you're going to have lots of feelings of disgust or fear or revulsion or contempt or happiness or sympathy in places that don't align with your consistent philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, listen, thanks a lot. This is, uh, you have stuck around over almost two hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> so <hungry. All> right. <laughs> you can follow Dr. Fleischman on Twitter and her blog, Diana Worse. This talk was made possible by Switch and Board Podcast Studios, a Washington, D.C. based production company trying to make quality podcasting as accessible as possible. Casual Intellectual is the English language counterpart to a popular Turkish podcast slash blog called Fularsız Entelik. We have interesting topics, accessible language, no distractions, and a few lame jokes here and there. Follow us for more English language content. Switch and board.